Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Welcome to episode 35. Today we are sending a Saturn V Apollo style rocket up to the moon. Before we do that, however, I have sent up the largest probe core, which of course has Kerbnet. And we have placed this into a polar orbit so that we can find all of the anomalies possible as we actually orbit the moon. Now all we need to do is find the question marks on the curve net map and basically target them and then add a waypoint. Now the waypoints will stick there so that you can use them whenever you're up here doing a mission. So what you can do with this largest probe core is set it right up to 90 degrees and you can have quite a high polar orbit. You can then spin around your orbit until you find another question mark. Now it won't pull up all the question marks for the anomalies every time. There is a percentage chance that you will find an anomaly and there's also more chance that you will not find one. A quick way to get out and do a rescan is to load into another sphere of influence with another vessel and then come back and try again. As soon as you find an anomaly on your map, the best thing to do then is to zoom right in, switch that field of view right in, and actually target it as accurately as you can, so that when you come back to actually land at this location, your marker there is going to be as accurate as it can be. There is of course a lot more information to know about Kerbnet, so check out any other video that talks about this. For now, we are heading back to the Space Center to check out our Saturn V. We'll just time warp until the next morning just so that the light is good for our launch. And we're going to hop into our vehicle assembly building to check out the Saturn V. I'm not going to show the build of this thing for now. There will be a link to the craft in the description. We have of course stage one, the booster stage, which was powered in real life by five F1 engines. For this model though, I've just added a vector engine to the center so that we've got five engines. That's about the only option I've got here with stock parts, so we'll go with that. We have our crew, Burberry, Lenina and Bill Kerman, who are our replacements, of course, for Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. As we scroll up the vessel, you can see all the various stages of the Saturn V. We've got the second stage, the third stage, and then we've got, of course, our lunar module and command and service modules here with the launch escape assembly on top there. So out to the launch pad we head with our Saturn V and lift off there. You will notice immediately that we seem to be very short on fuel and you're going to notice this through several stages in this launch and the reason why is because if we actually had this vessel fully fueled we would be able to get to the moon easily, easily. We could get to Duna with this thing if we fully fueled it. If you compare this vessel to the real Saturn V, you will notice that the real Saturn V also got to around the upper atmosphere before it ran out of fuel. That is, of course, what we aim to do here as well. So as we head up here, we are commencing our gravity turn, slowly turning over there. We want to be getting quite close to horizontal by the time our stage one is empty. We have four separatrons on both stages here, ready for separation. This keeps our vessel moving slowly forward as we separate into the second stage. Firing five of our vector engines in stage two, which in real life, of course, were the five J2 engines. This stage, like this stage in real life, is going to get us right up very close to orbital velocity. Now, we need to take this whole launch here with a grain of salt compared to in real life because, of course, Kerbal and all the planets in the system are at one-tenth scale, meaning the velocity needed to get into orbit is also at a one-tenth scale. Just passing 1700 meters per second, we're going to disconnect our second stage. Disconnecting this stage with some more separatrons. Firing off that launch tower there, of course, now that we're out of the upper atmosphere. And we are now running our third stage here on a single vector engine. And just a small burst and we are already in orbit, basically. So the next part of our burn here is our injection burn. Our translunar, or transmunar, I should say, injection burn up to intersect with the moon. In real life, the Saturn V's third stage did a similar thing. It did a small burn just to get into orbit and then spent around two thirds of its fuel actually in that translunar injection phase. As I speak, of course, I am setting up that translunar injection maneuver node there. 
We can see our debris falling harmlessly back into the atmosphere there as we time warp around and start our burn for our transmuner injection. Just over 800 meters per second that we need to add here to our velocity to get ourselves up to the moon. This third stage here has plenty of fuel in it. Again, I could have cut more fuel out of this stage and also the second stage to do this even less comfortably. Just a small correction there to bring the periapsis marker there around the moon, just up around that 30 to 40 kilometers. And now Burberry, Lanina and Bill can relax for a few minutes as we time warp out to around a point where our command service module will disconnect and come back in to capture the lunar module. In real life this happened around 30 minutes after the translunar injection burn. We'll just make sure we're controlling from that main docking port and of course setting our target to the docking port inside there in the lunar module. We're going to now turn around obviously and come back in using our RCS to dock with that lunar module. And then we're going to just slowly, gently extract that out through the fairings. Now in real life, the fairings do actually open up a little bit. Uh, this is probably as close as I could get to what the real Apollo 11 vessel was doing. The top portion of this sort of opened up in four segments, I believe, so that the uh, the command module could make its way in here to pick the limb back up. So it's it's a little hard to do that with stock parts. There's probably some mods that let you do this better, but uh, this is stock for you guys, so you can just download the thing and have a play with it. Using our RCS thrusters there to slowly pull the lunar module out there. Both the command surface module and the lunar module, of course, is at this point fully fueled in real life. We have again cut a lot of the fuel out to make this a little more realistic so that we are kind of simulating the mission as it would have really run. Stage 3 here still has some fuel in it so we're actually going to ditch this back onto Kerbin to get rid of all that debris. In real life the stage 3 there kept on flying out past the moon and actually ended up in a solar orbit. It can be quite interesting to think that that Stage 3 from Apollo 11 is still out there orbiting around our Sun. And one day perhaps it will stumble back into Earth's gravity well and be pulled down into Earth's atmosphere. It would be quite a poetic end I think to the Stage 3. For now though, we are kicking our command service modules engines into action. We're doing a retrograde burn here at the periapsis to basically bring ourselves down into a low orbit around the moon. Just aiming here for an orbit of around 50 kilometers. There we go there, that will do. Now what we want to do is see if we can actually land at this point here. And we might just do a very small anti-normal maneuver here just to raise those orbit lines just up so that we're crossing right over the path of that marker. We're just a little far away. I'm actually just doing this with RCS seeing as though it's such a small correction. I hadn't actually been down to this anomaly before so it was interesting coming down here to check out what was actually on the surface. So these anomaly scans can be really cool actually to let you find some things that you may not have found before. So I'll just time warp in here so that we're closer to the point where we're going to start our descent with the lunar module. We're going to transfer both Burberry Kerman and Lanina Kerman into our lunar module. They are going down to the surface while poor old Bill stays up here missing out all the fun. You've got to have mixed feelings being someone like Michael Collins who of course missed out on the moon landing but got to get so close. Sadly, most people of course know Neil Armstrong and even Buzz Aldrin by name, but not as many of course know Michael Collins by name. But he was one of the three that made that historic flight in the Apollo 11 vessel. Just popping out that antenna and the landing leg so that we can be ready to come down on the surface of the moon. Currently we have our trajectory here set up to just overshoot our anomaly by just a little bit. As we pass over the top of it we are going to hit the retrograde burn there and just wipe off the horizontal velocity. 
Now, spoiler alert here, if you don't want to know where the anomalies are, stop watching because you're going to find out. Basically, here we are coming down over the Moon Arch, which is, this is actually the first time I've visited the Moon Arch myself, which is a little sad considering how many hours I've been playing this game. Just turning here just a little, just so that we're not going to come right down on the peak of a hill there. Let's just aim here for landing in that crater. There is the moon arch over there in the background, looking much smaller than it actually is. We're still quite a distance away from it. We're going to take a bit of a flight, but for now we are just about to touch down there. So it's just a little dark here. We'll time warp until we have a sunrise here, and then we can pop out uh, Burberry Kerman, who is going to be the first person to EVA over to the Moon Arch. First though, before he does that, I think it's probably appropriate to plant a flag. Uh, we are here uh, in the Highlands, it appears, so we're going to just pop a flag down. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's actually, as I say, it's quite a distance to come all the way over here, but well worth the journey, I say. And flew straight past the damn thing. What a rookie mistake. Come back here, Burberry. And what a view. What a view. Let's get Lenina Kerman. She is, of course, our scientist. If anybody needs to be up here at the Moon Arch, it is Lenina. She needs to get her butt up here and grab some samples and things from the Moon Arch. And we will touch down right here next to Burberry. Of course, it seems appropriate to drop a flag here as well. What better place to place a flag than right on the top of a very precarious looking arch that seems to defy gravity for some reason. The arch, I dare say, must be made out of a very strong rock. Hence probably the name. I believe the anomaly is actually called the Rock Arch. So, you know, that would make sense. Okay, Lenina, it is time to head back gonna get you loaded back up into our lunar lander and the same thing goes for you too Burberry we can't leave you behind hop back on that ladder and board so we have our command and service module still orbiting around we're going to wait until that's just coming up overhead and as it passes right overhead there we are going to launch the very final segment of our lunar module, leaving the bottom segment of the lunar module there on the surface. Immediately we are going to turn 90 degrees and put as much thrust in the horizontal direction as we possibly can, trying to get as much horizontal velocity as quickly as possible. This last stage here is quite slow going, it is a single spark liquid fuel engine powering this thing. And just because it seemed cool at the time, I have 13 Oscar B fuel tanks arranged in a little bit of a hexagonal sort of design in the bottom of this thing. So you'll see that here shortly. We'll raise the apoapsis there right up to the orbit lines of our command service module and then we'll cut our engines. Now because we modified our landing when we were coming down, our inclination is a little different now to our command service module, so we're adjusting this here. Of course, we will then time warp up to the apoapsis marker and do another adjustment to bring ourselves very close in our velocity to the command service module so that we can start planning our intercept. Now, the lunar lander with Burberry and Lanina is running just a little ahead of the command service module, so we need to make our orbit a little longer. That means raising our apoapsis just a little bit until we can get those orange intersect markers to line right up. That small adjustment was literally only a few meters per second, and that made all the difference. With our nav ball in target mode, we're just doing a very small retrograde burn just to wipe off all that relative velocity, and then of course pointing towards our target, doing another quick burn so that we can close the distance so that we can meet back up with Bill, who I'm sure Lanina and Burberry are now missing terribly. You can see there those Oscar B fuel tanks are arranged there in that wacky way. They look kind of cool though. Just coming in here to dock. Whenever you're docking, of course, switch to that locked camera mode. It makes things much easier. Coming in here. 
And there we go, docked there. Lovely. It is now time for Burberry and Lanina to say goodbye to their home, which has been the MK2 Lander Can. They're going to be saying goodbye to this thing. What we're going to do here now that the two are out of their vessel is do a very small retrograde burn. And then we're going to release this thing here so that it impacts on the surface of the moon. Turning our service module back around in a prograde direction, we're going to switch on those engines, giving our lander can a last little push into obscurity. Time warping now around the moon so that we can get ready to do our moon ejection burn. This is going to bring us right out of the moon's sphere of influence and of course bring us back down into the atmosphere of Kerbin. And we're going to be targeting around 45 kilometers from the surface of Kerbin. That's going to give us enough atmospheric drag to re-enter completely on our first pass through the atmosphere. Before we hit the atmosphere, we are going to decouple our fuel tanks on our command service module here. We're going to do that in a anti-normal, normal direction just so they don't come back and hit us in the face. Now, I do have a large heat shield on this thing, but it is worth noting actually that, uh, that the command pod here actually has a very high heat tolerance. You can actually pretty much punch straight through the atmosphere like I'm doing here without a heat shield, and you won't explode this thing. This is one of the toughest parts in the game actually. Now, just out of pure luck, we are passing right over the top of the Kerbal Space Center here. Um, that wasn't at all planned, just, just an absolute fluke. By the looks of this, we're going to be landing way out past the old airfield, so we're not going to be too far away. We've got the three parachutes here at the top, just like the real Apollo 11 mission. And touchdown there, Lamina, Burberry and Bill, all home safe and sound. And yeah, only a few kilometers really away from the old airfield there, so that was pretty good. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. All of your support helps a huge, huge amount. If you have any questions for me, please do whack them down in the comments below. Thank you very much to all of you that have subscribed. Every subscriber, every view helps a massive amount. So thank you, thank you. For those that haven't yet, please do subscribe to see more. You can also, of course, follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video. Past orbital velocity, we are going to shut down our engines. We're going to disconnect our fully fueled space shuttle here. And because our periapsis is still so low, we can actually let our booster fall harmlessly back down into the atmosphere, leaving of course our space free of debris.